Praise the Lord. How are you doing this morning, evening, or night, whenever you're viewing this particular teaching on today? I'm the Chief Apostle and the Prayer Leader of the Houses of Prayer, Praise, and Worship. This is an outreach of the Houses of Prayer, Praise, and Worship, 2 Timothy 2.15. Um, I had to do a quick makeshift to get this message out because of this so-called holiday season. I'm not here to greet you a happy holiday or a Merry Christmas. I ask that you would just give me some time to spend some time with you and get some truths out so you can understand why you do what you do. i uh, been in ministry over 30 years and I've come to find out that people do things because other people do it. Or they do things because they say, well, that's the way it's always been. But is that true? Is it truly the way things always have been? So what we're going to do today, we're going to delve into this so-called holiday Christmas season. And I'm going to teach some things that I'm sure you have not heard, some things you might have heard, but there are some newfound information that I've done in my research. Now, my research papers is 15 pages long. I'm not going to go through all 15. I'm just going to hit some excerpts in them. If you want the teaching in its entirety, just contact the information that's on your screen, and I'll make sure I get you a copy of it. So today we're going to start. Let's pray. Father, we give you honor, glory, and praise on today. We thank you for your truths. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come unto the Father except through him. We know that truth can be confirmed. He was confirmed through 40 and two generations. He was prophesied of many, seen of a multitude, even when he was resurrected for 40 days. So on today, God, as I unravel these truths, God, I ask that you would touch your people's ears and their heart. Send them strong conviction, break the chains of, of, of paganism off of them, and deliver them. You promised that you would deliver your people, that we're washed and cleansed by the washing of the word. And according to 2 Timothy 2.15, we are to study to show ourselves approved unto you, not man, that we can be a workman that needeth not be ashamed, but rightly divide the word of truth. And we'll be careful to give you honor and glory and praise for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, my title today is How the Grinch Stole Christmas. How the Grinch Stole Christmas. The Grinch, How He Stole Christmas is a children's story by Theodore Dr. Seuss Gellis, written in rhymed verses with illustrations by the author. It follows the Grinch, a grouchy, solitary creature who attempts to put an end to Christmas by stealing Christmas-themed items. I want you to pay attention to that. He stole Christmas-themed items from the homes of nearby town Whoville on Christmas Eve. Despite his efforts, according to the movie or the cartoon or the book, Whoville's inhabitants still celebrated the holiday, so the Grinch returns everything that he stole and is a guest of honor at the Who's Christmas dinner. So I'm hoping that after this teaching that you don't, in spite of the truth, still celebrate something that God did not ordain for us to celebrate. Hold on, don't touch your dial. Hear me out. We don't know everything. I don't know everything. You don't know everything. So I ask that you would just listen and then you study behind me. Be like the Bereans where they check behind Paul. Everything that Paul brought to them, they check behind him to see if what he said was of God and was it the truth. Okay? So I just want you to follow me um, just a little bit. Of course, this is the Marriott of the Grinch. Those of us who are not too old and those of us still who are younger, you know, and you're going to see it again this year, the 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 fable, the story of the Grinch who stole Christmas. Okay, so the story was published as a book by Random House in 1957. And at approximately the same time, an issue of Red Book, the book criticizes, um, criticizes the commercialization of Christmas. Based on a 2007 online poll, the National Education Association named it um, one of its teachers' top 100 books for children. In 2012, it was ranked number 61 among the top 100 picture books in a survey punished, published by the School Library General, uh, Journal. Excuse me. The fourth of the five Dr. Seuss books on the list. 
The book was adapted as a Christmas special twice, a 1966 animation TV film starring Boris Koloff as both the narrator and the voice of the Grinch, and in 2000, a live action feature film starring Jim Carrey. There were also um, to be a computer animated adoption. So here, in the Urban Dictionary, the word Grinch, listen to this, was uh, depicted as a hairy creature. It's him, a hairy creature. But the Urban Dictionary um, is a word used to describe a hairy, sweaty, smelly vagina. But I have dubbed it as a demon that steals. A demon that steals. So those of y'all who are in spiritual warfare, we could call out that spirit of the Grinch who literally stole the theme and the, the, the notoriety from Jesus. You know, it's supposed to be about Jesus, about his death, his birth, his death, and his resurrection. And this demon, the Grinch, through the holiday season of so-called Christmas, had stole the attention and the focus from our Lord and Savior and placed it on many other things that had nothing to do with him. Nothing at all. Listen to me closely, and I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to give you some excerpts, but I want you to write me and, and request or call me and request a copy of this 15-page research. Okay? Because we're commanded in the word of God that everything that we do, we're supposed to do it all in the name of Jesus. All to the glory of God through Jesus to the Father. And this holiday, this Christmas, has just taken over for the past several hundred years. It's taken over. It's taken over. Well, not even several hundred years in America. We're going to see. But listen to this. Um, I did a research behind a Dr. Russell K. Tardo who wrote The Shocking Truth About Christmas. He goes further and says this, we Americans take Santa Claus, presents, holly, trees, cow singing, and all other pleasant Christmas customs very much for granted. How intriguing it is to trace them to their origins. So that we have to realize everything has a beginning, but guess what? Everything has an expiration tag on it too. Everything has an expiration date. So we want to go back to the origins and the beginning of this so-called Christmas. Okay, follow me now. This isn't legalism. This is truth. This is fact. And I want to say this. This is why the atheists and the gays and every other uh, um, false religion and pagan belief is now overriding and succumbing and overriding Christianity because they deal with the truths and the facts. And we as Christians have grabbed hold of things that had nothing to do with Christ. And those people who reject Christ use that truth against us. They are using Christmas as a truth against us. This is why you, don't, you, you see the laws now where you can't put nativity scenes out. This is why you can't say Christmas or Christ mass. You have to say happy holidays. Because it has nothing to do with Christianity. They beat us in the courts because they told the truth. It is now time for us as Christians to adhere to those truths and tell them you was right. Because Jesus has nothing to do with this holiday. But I'm going to go a little further. But anyway, look what he says. Many of our cherished traditions are buried deep in pagan past. In fact, when Christmas was first officially established... The date concluded, coincided, excuse me, with ancient celebrations of the sun's rebirth at winter solstice. The church saw no reason to destroy the old customs, and so they were adopted to fit the celebration of the birth of Christ. Did you hear that? These pagan worships were around before Jesus was even born in the flesh. Not before Jesus now, because Jesus was here in the beginning. When In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh. And in the beginning, there was nothing made that was not made by him. So in the beginning, when God the Father said, let there be light, that was Jesus making the light. He created everything. 
He was in spirit form. Okay? But before he came in the flesh, these pagan worships and holidays had already existed. And what the Catholic Church did is they, to win the people, and I'm not trying to dog the Catholics, but let me tell you something. The Catholics have been behind a whole lot of uh, erroneous doctrines for hundreds, thousands of years. They've been behind a whole lot. I remember when I was coming up, the Catholic Church had, had commissioned and ordained for the, the local priests to allow giving out cigarettes to get people to come to church. They're the ones who gamble in the church basement playing bingo, which is gambling. That's a whole other Bible study. So we need to trace the history of different denominations, different religions. Do you know that there's baseline over 3,000 different denominations in America? We've gotten almost like the Hindus who have 6,000 gods. Now, there's a reason for these things, and that's why we have to study to find out what is the truth. You know, someone asked me one time, well, Apostle, who has the truth? Nobody has it all. Everybody has a part of it when it comes to these denominations. I don't care who it is. I don't care if it's T.D. Jakes. I don't care if it's the Pope. I don't care who, who, whoever you name. I don't care who it is. Creflo Dollar, all of them. I can find the error in every last one of them. Okay? But time is drawn nigh, not so much that Jesus is going to crack the sky, because we've been hearing that for years. But people are dying every day. The Bible says it's a point that a man wants to die. After that is your judgment. You might not never be here in time for the rapture. But we know one thing, you are going to die. And if you don't have it right when you stand before God, Matthew's the seventh chapter, the 19th through the 23rd verse, said many going to come in that day. What day? Judgment day. And say, Lord, Lord, meaning ruler, ruler, which they're lying. They call him the ruler, but they didn't let him be the ruler. Have I not prophesied in your name? Have I not cast out demons and devils even in your name? Have I done many wonderful works in your name? I'm not telling you that some of these people are not doing wonderful works, but Jesus is going to tell them, depart from me. I don't know you. Matter of fact, he said, I never knew you. You worker of iniquity. The word iniquity doesn't just mean sin. It means a person who is sinning and trying to make it look like it's God. So this pagan holiday, this pagan worship of Christmas, so-called Christmas, or this so-called holiday season, that we try to make it look like it's God, has nothing to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. It does have something to do with a God, little g, little idolatry gods. But anyway, let's go a little further. First thing, the first argument is Christ was not born on December 25th. Wasn't. December 25th is not the birth time of Jesus Christ. It's not the birth date of, his, of his, him coming into this world. Although Christians everywhere observe this day as a birth date of Christ, we know that he was definitely not born on December 25th. We're going to find out why. Nor at any time during the winter season. How about that? At least two factors make this quite evident. Note that the Bible records uh, concerning the time of Jesus' birth. A, and there were the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night, according to Luke, um, second chapter, the eighth verse. As these shepherds were watching their sheep by night in the open fields, the angel came um, to them with a message of the birth of Christ. It has uh, been well established that the shepherds of Judea do not themselves abide, nor did they keep their flocks in these open fields any later than about the end of October due to the piercing nature of the winter, the wind, the rain, and the cold. Shepherds, good shepherds, know what they're doing. They don't want their animals out there freezing. And at night, it's colder at night than it is in the daytime. So I'm, I'm going to try not to take you too fast. They have a, a, a thing called sheep gate where they would bring them back out of the fields and put them in a corral built out of bricks or wood or a wall all the way around in a warmer place and where there's more stored food and everything for them. So they did not take them out in the fields in the winter time. They did all their grazing in the spring, summer, and part of the fall. 
So Jesus could not have been born in the winter time. Somebody said, well, Pastor, you're talking about overseas. I don't care. It's not tropical. They still have the winters over there. In Jerusalem and Israel, it gets cold. It gets cold. You look on the news, you'll see the people over there with jackets, and it gets cold. So that's one of, the, one of the points. The shepherds always bring their flocks in from the mountain slopes and the fields no later than the 15th of October. Obviously, the, ver- the birth of Christ could not have occurred at a late winter season as December 25th. B, the Bible records that at the time of Christ's birth, Caesar Augusta had decreed that all the world should be taxed. We know the story why Mary and Joseph had to travel. And all went to be taxed, everyone in his own city, according to Luke, the second chapter, the first and the third verse. It was because of the tax that Joseph traveled to Bethlehem to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being with child. That's verse 5. While in Bethlehem, unable to secure a room in which to lodge, Mary delivered her child in a stable behind an inn. Currently, this could not have been occurred in the winter since travel at the time of this year was very difficult. Listen to this. Caesar would not have ordered such a taxation then since it would have been virtually impossible for everyone to comply. Caesar wasn't going to miss out on any money. So he wasn't going to make a decree for you to travel to come and be counted so you can pay your taxes, come back to your original place of birth. You know, these people, even though they were false worshipers and, and, you know, they was pagan idolatry worshipers, they wasn't stupid people when it came to, you know, money, when it came to business. So they knew what they was doing. They had architects, they had advisors, and everything would tell them what was the best time to have people come and go. So he didn't want to miss out on any money, so there's no way in the world that he would have them come during the wintertime knowing that people would die, you know, people would freeze to death, and, and people wouldn't, it would be harder for them to be able to make the trip. If anything, he would pick a time like spring or fall when the temperature's just right. It's not too hot, not too cold for people to be traveling. Remember, they walked, and they rode donkeys and horses and camels and stuff for hundreds of miles. It took them days weeks to travel okay so it says here he wouldn't have done it travel was so bitter hard and hazardous during the deep winter seasons that Jesus himself told the people to pray that their flight at the end of this age would not be in the winter but pray that your flight be um, not in the winter according to Matthew 24 20 in fact history records that this taxation always took place at the end of harvest which was sometimes in September or October, and much more logically, a much more logical time for taxation and travel. Obviously, Christ could not have been born on December 25th. His birth date was probably sometime in the fall of the year, but no exact day can be determined. Even the Roman Catholics are compelled to admit that, that the date of Christ's birth is not known. It's not known. And I don't want to jump ahead of myself because I know this information I want to take my time. That's why I'm following it to keep on track. But the truth is, nobody really knows his date of birth. A lot of scholars argue that really, and I'm sort of in agreement that the birth was mostly around the springtime when we celebrate so-called Easter. That's a whole nother Bible study. Because in Easter, I mean, in the springtime is when all the, the shepherds would take their sheep out, and that's the only time of the year that the sheep would have babies. And they'd be out there tending the flock and taking care of the babies and whatnot. But um, that's a whole other Bible study. Let me go a little further. My second point is, Christmas is not biblical doctrine. Christmas is not, I'm going to say that again. Christmas is not biblical doctrine. Now, I have a pet peeve, and I'm a stickler about the word of God. I don't know everything, but I do know how to find out everything. And I'm going to tell you this, especially as an apostle, Especially as people today saying that they're apostles and prophets. I mean, even if you say you're a pastor and evangelist, a teacher, according to the New Testament, according to our new covenant with God, Christ, via the Holy Ghost, y'all like to say the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, spoke through Paul, Peter, and the other disciples 
who became apostles and gave the structure of the church on how we should be living from that day forth. Excuse me. We can't talk about, well, that's how it was back then in the early church times. No, it, nothing has changed. If you read the New Testament, everything that they did in the church, we're supposed to be doing today. Nothing's changed. Nothing has changed. God finished the book. The book was finished, established, canonized, and organized so we would know how to live this life. You will not find Christmas as a doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ, not from Genesis to Revelation. You won't find the disciples. You won't find the apostles. You won't find Jesus. You won't see nobody celebrating Christmas. Why in 33 and one-third years of Jesus' life when he was alive didn't they have his birthday celebration every year? Why he didn't say, celebrate my birth? The only thing Jesus told us to celebrate was his death and his resurrection. He told us to put in remembrance of his resurrection, his death and his resurrection. You won't see nowhere where the disciples, nowhere where the apostles and nobody celebrated Christmas. So it's not biblical doctrine. One author asks, what was Christmas? Had Christ or his apostles made it a holy day? Is there any passage anywhere in the Bible encouraging us to celebrate Christ's birth? Emphatically, no. This author continues and answers himself. Christmas was a survival of old pagan sat, uh, Saturnalia worship. Saturnalia worship. The worship of the planet Saturn. This is where this practice came from. It had nothing to do with Jesus Christ. Another writes, another author writes, if our blessed Lord had wanted us to celebrate his birthday, he would have told us when to celebrate it, how to celebrate it, and where to celebrate it, but Christ never told anyone to celebrate his birthday. Furthermore, we know from the Bible and from church history that the apostles in the early, early church never celebrated Christ's birth. Never. Not one time. When you see it in the Bible anywhere where we're to celebrate his birth. Oh, what about when the wise men came and wasn't they celebrating his birth? We're going to talk about that. No, we're going to talk about that. That's why it's imperative and it's important that you would study behind everybody. Listen, I, I'm going to advocate nobody disrespecting their leader, but let me tell you something. I've been under many leaders, and if I had not studied, for myself. I wouldn't be the man of God that I am today. I wouldn't know what I know. I wouldn't know how to worship God in spirit and in truth according to the way that he says he should be worshipped. Am I perfect? No. Do I miss the mark? Yes. But one thing about me, no matter how messed up I am, I let the word of God be truth and every man be a liar. Let every man be a liar. Let the word of God be true. And I always ask people, can we at least agree that we're wrong and God is right? So we need to know what is right with God. You can't get right if you think you're right already. You can't get right. And it would be a shame, you know, oh, I hear somebody. I don't see where uh, celebrating Christmas is going to send me to hell. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, it is. And then we're going to touch on the scriptures. God said, you don't worship no God beside him. And we're going to find out where this thing is being worshipped. This is, this is worship. Christmas is worship. And it has nothing to do with Jesus Christ. But we say Jesus and we don't, but listen, Jesus said Satan and him have nothing to do with one another. You can't take something that's satanic. You can't take something that's pagan. You can't take something that's not God and then give that to God as a replacement. If you don't believe me, ask Abraham. Abraham originally tried to sacrifice uh, uh, um, um, Ishmael to the Lord. And God rejected that sacrifice. And he accepted uh, um, um, Isaac instead because Isaac was the promise. So anything that's not ordained of God, God rejects it. I don't care how much you lace it up, make it sound good. You could, you could do, listen, I know all the gimmicks, I know all the games. 
And, and, and even me and God, we wrestle with this sometimes. I'd be like, Lord, you know, it is funny how these people have an anointing from you, a spiritual gift. Let's tell it what it really is. They've, they've developed a spiritual gift, and what people are doing, they're putting their spiritual gift to, to confirm paganism and false doctrine. You know, because the, the argument I always get from somebody whenever I'm teaching them something and it's against their pastor or against their denomination, they say, well, I know one thing, they're anointed. And I'm saying, I'm not telling you they're not anointed. Anointed just means saturated. If you just fast and pray and saturate yourself in prayer, you're going to pick up a spiritual gift. Your spiritual gift is going to wake up because you're spirit wrapped in flesh. So people have found out how to wake up their spiritual gift, how to move into spiritual realms principalities, powers, rulers, darkness, wickedness, heavenly places, and, and people think and they attribute that to being the Holy Ghost because they feel the power. And I did a teaching on different powers. There's all kind of power. There's wind power. There's water power. There's electrical power. And there is spiritual power. And all spiritual powers are not God. So I can take my spiritual gift and teach something in and loose my spiritual gift through this video, and you can feel it, and you'll think, because I feel this anointing from you, what he's saying must be true. That's a whole other Bible study, honey. There's a whole lot of gimmick going on in the church, and there's a whole lot of ministers that are deceived themselves and don't realize that's what they're doing. They do realize it, though, because I remember when I slipped up and did it. And I remember when the Holy Ghost checked me and told me, you got to make a decision now. You're going to go this way you know, for the fame and the fortune, because believe me, I was on TV, I was on radio, you know, I had the audience, I had their ear in Virginia, all across the East and West Coast, I was known. And I had to make a decision. Do I sell out for this paganism and work my gift? They even took me in back rooms and would teach it. Doc, oh my God, you, you, you're so anointed, and what you just, one thing you forgot to do, you forgot to ask them Negroes for money. You forgot to tell them how much money, and all, uh, listen, Whole nother Bible study. But I'm saying that to say this. This is the same thing that happened with this Christmas. They took those pagan worships that they did not want to give up, those idol gods, and because they didn't want to give it up and to appease the people to give them some glitter and some glam, they mixed it and called it doctrine, and the Bible has no such doctrine. Okay? My third point December 25th does not have profound religious significance. It doesn't. In fact, long before Christ was born, December 25th was the most widely recognized and celebrated holiday of ancient times among idolatrous, um, idolatrous nations. It was already a big holiday overseas where it started, in the continent of Africa. That includes Saudi Arabia, Jerusalem, all of that. All that's the continent of Africa. It was already a big pagan worship. If you don't believe me, study behind me. This day was universally recognized and celebrated as the birth of the sun god, Mithra. Mithra. The sun god, Mithra. Winter solstice and all that was a worship to a sun goddess. That's why even on Christmas and New Year's Eve, they have those watch night services where they go and they sit and they watch the sun rise and talk about they give God glory. No, that came from pagan worship of a sun god to worship the sun when it comes up. Who is known by other names in different parts of the world. The birth of other sun gods such as Horus, Horus, Hercules, Bacchus, Adonis, Jupiter, Jupiter, excuse me, Tamazin, Saturn, and etc. was celebrated on December 25th. Also, Christmas originated with pagan sun worship. It was the celebration of the winter solstice, and in time of the merriant revel and drunkenness, the very same way many celebrate it still today. Now we both know, we all know, Christmas is the most debauchery worst time of the year. People, I hear you, no, apostle, no, man, our family come together, it's all this love, joy, and peace. What are you, why would you lie to yourself and say that? 
It's the time of the year the most highest crime, the most suicides, murders, rapes, orgy, orgies, uh, um, drunken parties, people dying from uh, drunken driving, you name it, the worst of the worst happens during this season. More people go in debt and lose, get things cut off because of this season. Trying to keep up with this. Listen, the Bible says that the devil come to steal, kill, and destroy. Who that sound like? Christmas don't sound like God. That sound like the devil. He come to steal, kill, and destroy. What happens during the Christmas season? Killing, stealing, destroying. If you don't believe me, leave your packages in the backseat of your car. If they don't knock you inside the head and kill you before you get back to the car, they'll break open your windows and get it. Pop open your trunk. Run you over getting away. Come on, let's tell the truth, people. The Bible says you know them by their fruit. What is the fruit of Christmas? Are people getting saved? Are people living holy? No, they're not. Family just traveling, getting together, getting drunk and partying and getting high all night long. How you know, Apostle? Because I used to do it. Couldn't wait the Christmas so I could smoke them blunts. So I can be nice and fat for the, the Christmas dinner. I can be nice and hungry for the Christmas dinner. There's more kissing cousins going on then. People traveling all across the states, meeting their cousins. I was there. Listen, let's get real. Let's get real. I was there. I had friends talking about, yeah, she's my cousin, but she's fine, and I got her. Nothing holy coming out of Christmas. Every unholy thing comes out of Christmas. Most of our current Christmas customs, such as decorating the evergreen trees, we're going to talk about it, lights, the holly, and the mistletoe. Oh, my God, wait till we talk about the mistletoe. Exchange of presents, parties, and rivalry, all were essential elements of the pagan winter solstice. If you don't believe me, ask people who are not Christians. They know. They did their research. They did their research. History records just how firmly entrenched these heathen celebrations had become in society. And when Roman Catholic Church could not persuade the public to give up these idolatrous practices, they adopted them. Again, I'm not trying to dog the Catholic Church, but the Catholic Church has been behind. So let me tell you something. Them and the ungenerated Jews... And I'm not trying to preach against Jews. I'm not trying to preach hate against Jews. Listen, can we tell the truth? Can we tell the truth? I mean, it's just like black men getting gunned down by police. Can we, is that true or is that not true? That's not dogging the police. That's not the dog, dogging the police department. That's a truth. That's a fact. Gunned down. Murdering them in the streets. It's just the truth. And I don't see how people are so offended by the truth. The Bible said, know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Not set you free, make you free. It's a process. you got to start getting loose from this stuff. Because God takes this stuff very seriously. I didn't raise my children in this Christmas stuff. And, and, and the Santa Claus and all that. Did I take advantage of it? I sure did. I was wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. I told him, if y'all would wait after the Christmas holiday season, I'm going to go buy everything that's on sale, all the gifts that return. Matter of fact, I used to wrap up gifts for them all year long except for Christmas. I would put Christmas lights in their room because all the kids wanted to see was lights. I would decorate their room and celebrate them every day. Year round, except for Christmas. Christmas is the only day, so there ain't going to be no gifts, no gift giving, no none of that stuff. No we're going to fast, we're going to pray, we're going to worship the true and the living God. We're not going to put up no trees, we're not going to give gifts, we're not going to accept gifts, we're not going to give cards, we're not going to accept cards. Okay? So the Catholic Church, when they couldn't convince people, and this is not just the Catholic Church, you know, all the churches today, all the denominations of different religions today, they, they, they punch drunk. They weary of you. Because they know if they dare say these things, you're not coming. Oh, you ain't. I had a lady that was supposed to be coming to my church, liked the teaching, and she found out, you don't celebrate Christmas? I'm like, well, don't move too quick now. Wait and sit down and hear the teaching. And then see, make a decision. No, I can't come to your church. You don't celebrate Christmas. I got to, I got to celebrate Christmas. I can give gifts. And, and then people lie and say it's because of the children. 
and the children are grown. She had a child that's 20-something, 30-something years old. Don't believe in Santa Claus. No Santa Claus is a lie. Still celebrating it. So now what's your excuse? Anyway. So the Catholic Church, just like all other churches and, and denominations, have adopted it. The Catholic Church adopted every pagan aspect of this abominable, ab abominable custom, including the date, and simply renamed it. Now, instead of representing the birth of uh, Tamazu and Saturn or any other sun gods, it was supposed to celebrate the birth of Christ. They mixed Christianity with paganism. I'm going to say it again. They mixed Christianity with paganism. It was the 5th century that, Roman Catholic, that the Roman Catholic Church commended that the birth of Christ be observed forever on December 25th in the 5th century. Back in the 5th, so Christmas wasn't always. And the 5th century was well after the apostles and all of them. The apostles and all of them were back in like the 1st century. So I want to say this to you. Instead of fighting truth, study. Because what you do is you come against the true men and women of God who's teaching and, and giving you the truth, and you make them weary. I've seen so many give up. I had given up. Get so tired and say, Lord, you give me all these truths, and these people don't want to hear this, man. They don't want to adhere to this. They going over to Joe Smo church, and his church is just blowing up. Oh, they got these people on TV by the hundreds of thousands following. They got the trees in the pulpit. They celebrating this Christmas and all this and a whole lot of other false doctrines. But we're not talking about them today. We're talking about Christmas. And it makes them weary. But this is how the Grinch, this demon, this is how the Grinch stole Christmas. This is the truth about how the Grinch stole Christmas. That's a spirit. Look what it says. The, uh, the day of the old Roman feast of the birth of Sol, one of the names of the sun god. No honest investigator could deny these plain facts. When you celebrate Christmas, you are actually participating in an ancient sun worship ritual. It is nothing less than sacrilegious idolatry. Britannica had this to say about Christmas. It's observant as the birth of the Savior is intended with secular customs often drawn from um, pagan sources. Indeed, both Christmas and Epithalia, um, which falls uh, 12 days later in January 6th, are transformed uh, pagan celebrations of the winter solace. And so closely linked that their origins cannot be discussed separately. December 25th in Rome was the date of the pagan festival, the birth of the unconquered sun god. Nothing could be plainer. December 25th is a celebration of the pagan sun deities, not the birth of Christ. The Bible says, put away the strange gods that are among you and be clean, according to Genesis 35 and 2. Christians should have nothing to do with it. So all the way back, even in Genesis, the people of God, the creation of God, had started worshiping pagan idols. Now, now, what makes it hard today is, it, you know, because of technology, social media, uh, promotions, the psychology of, I got a degree in psychology, and, and there's a psychology for marketing. There's an actual psychology for marketing and, you know, making stoves and making them user-friendly. You know, most people are right-handed, so this knob be on this hand, this and that. They really map it out. And because of merchandising, they have really mapped you out with this Christmas to make gain of you and to cause you to make gain of each other and make sports of each other. So they know how to wrap it up and make it look pretty. I mean, part of this Christmas celebration, they got me. I went and bought the little blow-up Grinch that's supposed to go in your front yard just to teach this. Thus saith the Lord God, are you polluted after the manner of your fathers? Look what Paul is asking. Are you polluted as the, after the manner of your fathers? Your parents, their parents' parents, and their parents' parents, 
who did this pagan worship. He asked them, for when you offer your gifts, you pollute yourselves with all your idols. Shall I be inquired of you, uh, by you? Pollute ye my holy name no more with your gifts and with your idols. According to Ezekiel 20, 30, 31 to 39. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 16. Uh, for what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness? What fellowship? Fellowship means hanging out. What, what fellowship? It means canonial sin, communing, sitting down, breaking bread, eating, hanging out. What, what fellowship does righteousness have with unrighteousness? Oh, apostle, but you're not going to be no island to yourself. God has a remnant. I'm not by myself. Well, don't we have to go among them to get them? Yeah, to get them delivered. To get people saved. And, I, and, and don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to come from a self-righteous perspective. I'm not trying to come from a holier than thou's perspective. Can we just talk about the truth on how the Grinch stole Christmas? Can we just tell the truth? This is how the Grinch stole Christmas. So Paul asked him, what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion have light with darkness? And what concord have Christ with Bill, the devil? Or what part have he believed with an infidel? <laughs> Hold on. This is some strong talk by Paul. He said, what part of your life cause you to believe along with the infidel. The word infidel means a non-believer in God. Okay? The Muslim use it for a non-believer in Allah because that's their God. But infidel and back in the early church time in the biblical times that was the worst thing you could have been called because everybody had a God. Everybody had some type of idol you know some type of God. Paul said what part you have with the infidel? The unbeliever. And what agreement have the temple of God with idols? What? New Testament. Paul said, what agreement do the temple of God, whether it be your physical temple or he's talking about the temple where you worship, what does that have to do with the idols? What agreement does it have with idols? These are idols. It's not supposed to be in the church. But the Roman Catholic Church under Constantine began the adoption under Christian forms, not only of pagan rites and ceremonies, but also of pagan festivals. In Rome, the Saturnalia was the most vile, immoral feast that ever disgraced the pagan city. Did you hear that? It was the most vile festival. Talking about an orgy of drunkenness and every debauchery thing you could think on going on in the streets. Now remember, the whole city did this. It was a season of licensed drunkenness and debauchery. The spirit of rivalry had prevailed, and the entire city wanted indulged in the filthiness, sorts of immorality, and imaginable. Anything you could think of was going on. You think we have filth today? Let me tell you, we haven't even caught up to what they was doing back in biblical times. We haven't even caught up to it. We haven't even caught up to it, especially in Rome. The Romans were sexually filthy. They were some filthy people. So the writer goes on and says this, Dear reader, isn't it plainly obvious to you that though its name had been changed, the same spirit of, of Miriam is present in our modern Christmas celebrations. There is no doubt um, of the fact that Christmas is the most drunken, immoral time of the whole year. Any liquor salesman will tell you that the more alcohol beverages are bought and sold and given and consumed at Christmas than any other time of the year. The fact, that fact alone assures me that Christmas is not of God. If it were, it would be a time of holiness and repentance and drawing closer to God and turning from sin. Say that again. I like that. If Christmas had anything to do 
what I was Savior, it will show forth the fruits, and this will be the fruits. It will be a time of holiness, repentance, and drawing closer to God and turning away from sin. It will be a time when true spirituality and godliness would abound, but instead, just the opposite is true. The public celebrates it just as the ancient Saturnalia was celebrated. With drunkenness and the office apart, with office parties, um, rivalry and lewdness, blaspheming and indulging every sort of sin imaginable. This is the true spirit behind Christmas. And if you would tell yourself the truth, you know that's true. You know that's true. How many people at Christmas parties throw away their ambition, inhibitions and, and, and sleep with this one and sleep with that one and, and you have all this office gossip. You know y'all can't wait till the office party comes so you have somebody talk about they got drunk and did this and did that. And you hoping it's your supervisor and your supervisor is hoping it's you so they can see your true character. My fifth point. All the elements and symbols commonly associated with Christmas have pagan overtones and idolatrous significance. The Christmas tree, for example, holly, ivy, and mistletoe, greenery, were widely considered as symbols of immortal immorality and fertility among ancient pagan nations. Since these evergreens never lose their leaves nor turn brown, symbolizing death through the winter season, as did other trees. Therefore, a certain reverence was attached to them by superstitious pagans. Because the evergreen leaf didn't die in the fall. They worshipped it. Because for them it was a sign of everlasting life. Where the other trees would die. Says one author, our primitive forefathers brought in green branches at, at the winter solace and used them Listen to this, in magical rites and ensured the return of vegetation. To ensure the, the return of vegetation. They did rituals. They did spiritualism. They did witchcraft with the green trees, your so-called Christmas tree. They brought it in and they used it to assure that the vegetation would come back in the springtime and grow so they wouldn't starve. Trusting all these other deities, and I would love to do a study on how that even came into play. Where did they learn to do that, and what was the manifestation of it? Because I'm sure they had a manifestation. Roman houses was decorated with laurel and bay, and for many centuries now, Christian homes and churches have burst into greenery at Christmas time. It is true that the early church forbade the custom as savoring as, as savoring of paganism, but it was deeply rooted for such prohibitions to have permitted effect, permanent effect, excuse me, having permanent effect. It was so deeply rooted, even though the early church forbid it, they couldn't get it out. It had a permanent effect on the, even the early church Christians. They didn't want to let go of their pagan worship. They brought it along with them. But back then it wasn't called Christmas, remember. It was a sun god worship. Holly, ivy, and mistletoe our favorite decorations now, and were in the early times. To our ancestors, they were uh, strong life symbols, and not only because they were evergreens, but also they became unlike most plants. They bear fruit in the winter, but traditional holly and ma is um, listen to this. But traditional holly is masculine, and ivy is feminine. Listen, thus both are needed if all the house are to share in the blessings of their implied fertility. Mistletoe, the golden ball of classic legend, was held sacred by the Celtic Druids, those who started Halloween worship, which we know is demonic, and by the Norsemen. It was once called the plant of peace under um, which enemies were reconciled in ancient Scandinavia. It brought good luck and fertility. It protected the house that contained it from witchcraft and was an antidote to poison. Yet, unlike holly and ivy, it never quite lost its heathen character. Now, I'm going to take you even deeper. Now, I don't know about you, but see me, 
when I rededicated my life back to Christ in my early 20s, I just, I just lost my mind. I really wanted to know the truth because I had some family members that was into some false worship and, and they was pastors of the church and deacons and ministers and, you know, elders, you know, reverends. And I really went on a, 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 a venture to find out the truth. So I even talked to witches, real witches. I'm talking about witches who are not ashamed to say they're a witch. And I sat down with them. I prayed. And the Lord allowed me to go in. He cloaked my spirit. Didn't start no fight. I was curious. I really wanted to know. And all of these things, before I even knew about it, for Christmas, when I talked to the witches, they were doing and using. You know, a lot of people now, these witches hide themselves as what they call herbalists. They'll, they say the herbs, but then they go pick another tree, and it's not an herb. <laughs> You know, it kills me. You're an herbalist. You're a witch. You're a witch. You're a spiritualist and you're a witch. You're doing the same thing that the Celtics and the Druids did. They worship the plants. Oh, but apostle, the Bible talking about healing in the least. No, now it's New Testament time. The healing is by the Holy Ghost. And I'm not knocking that there's not herbs out there that do you some good. But it is not supposed to take the place of the Holy Ghost. It's not supposed to take the place of Jesus. And this, these people did that. They worshiped it above the Lord Jesus. Another states why kissing is associated with the mistletoe and is somewhat observed. But because a mistletoe roll is a fertility symbol, it stands reason that the kissing associated with it carries a sexual rather than a merely platonic implications. Okay? So, you know, I heard a preacher say before, you know, if you're connected at the lips, you're going to get connected at the hips. Now watch this. It gets deeper about the mistletoe. The practice is believed to have originated with the Celtic mis uh, Midsummer Eve ceremony when the mistletoe was gathered. During that festival, the men would kiss each other as a display of their homosexuality. The mistletoe started with homosexual overtones. The men would kiss each other they would stand under the mistletoe and kiss each other. <laughs> Displaying their homosexuality. The custom was later broadened to include both men and women. Some uh, historians believe that kissing under the mistletoe is a reminiscent of the temple prostitution and a sexual license that was um, prolific during the Roman Sagittalia. Thus, we can plainly see that the use of the greenery as Christmas perpetuates that the ancient religious writs and superstitions that God so vehemently condemns. Make no mistake that the current custom of cutting down a perfectly good healthy tree, propping it up in our homes and decorating it, it with tinsel and, and globs of certain certainty does not spring from any Christian tradition. It was an idolatrous practice of ancient pagans that has been passed down through the centuries why should the church of the Lord Jesus Christ perpetuate a custom that is anti-Christ in nature? How the Grinch stole Christmas. Listen, stick with me. Stick with me till we finish this. And if you want a copy of this, I will send it to you in its entirety. Just follow the prompts on your screen. Write to us and we send it to you. Okay? Help us out with the paperwork, you know, send a donation or something for the printing and everything else. We rent our own printer so we can print out about 3,000 copies of stuff a month, you know, sending out to people. So we'd appreciate you helping us to get this word out and to spread this word. The first decorating of evergreen tree was done by pagans in honor of their god, small g, Adonis, who after being slain was brought to life by a serpent, um, I don't know how to spell this long. Asclepius, A E S C U L A P I U S. The representation of this slain god, little G, was a dead stump of tree. Around the stump coiled the snake, Asclepius, a symbol of restoring life. 
And lo, from the roots of the dead tree comes forth another different tree, an evergreen tree, symbolic of the pagans of the God who cannot die. In Egypt, listen, y'all always talk about this Egypt. You know, there's this new worship that even Christians are into. Um, yeah, in Egypt, we was this, we was that. And listen to me, the Egypt was the biggest false worshipers who, who, who irritated God. What, what Bible are you reading? What history are you reading? Oh, but they built the pyramids. and I, Yeah, they're cursed. That's why they're over there dead. That's why the statues is, is, is rotten. That's why the pyramids is just sitting there. Do you realize that all of those were symbolic of worship? That's why the mummies are still in their tombs. These pharaohs and all these things were considered gods. And that, that was supposed to have been being sent on to the afterlife. Along with their cat and their servants. And they killed all of them and mummified them and sent them on un, involuntarily. And it irritated God so much that God's wrath fell on them. They don't even exist no more. But because of the old relics, you want to go back and dig back into that because they were black and claim some type of right? You're crazy to say that because if, you, if you're identifying yourself with the Egyptians, you're identifying yourself with the most cursed people on the planet of Earth. God created, uh, did total genocide against them because of the false worship. You don't see this Egyptian worship now except for some ignorant black people now in America that's trying to embrace it and wearing all this stuff and nephrotelia. And you don't even know what you're talking about. And Christianity dates back further than Egypt and Egyptian worship. No, we don't, Apostle. Christianity didn't appear until in, in Acts when they called us Christians in Antioch. Listen, it means followers of Christ. Christ was here in the beginning in Genesis. That was Christianity back then. We just didn't call it Christianity. But that was Christianity. Better start studying your Old Testament. If you know your Old Testament, see, a lot of people don't know their Old Testament Bible. So they don't know that Jesus, the Christophanies of Jesus, was showing up back in the Old Testament time. But anyway, in Egypt, this God was worshipped in the palm trees in, in Baal Tamar. The fir tree was worshipped in Rome as the same newborn God as Bel birth, Bel birth, who was restored to life by the same serpent. And the feast was held in honor of him on December 25th called the birth of the unconquered son. The birth of the unconquered son. Back in Egyptian times, not Christmas, had nothing to do with Christ. I'm almost out of here. In numerous Bible passages, the green tree is associated with false worship and idolatry. I'm going to say that again. In numerous Bible passages, the green tree is associated with false worship and idolatry. Since most trees are green at one time or another, those passages most certainly refer to a tree that is expressly noted for being green, the evergreen. With that in mind, consider what God says in Jeremiah. I love this one. 10, 1 through 5. Now, there's some people say, oh, I studied that. That had nothing to do with the Christmas tree. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. Listen what in the book of Jeremiah, what is it, three, 600 years before Jesus even showed up on the scene, they already was putting up Christmas trees. They just wasn't called Christmas trees. Same concept. The practice was already being done. What they tried to do, you know, is try to attribute that and bring that over into Christianity. Look what it says. Jeremiah 10, 1 through 5. And compared to the presents, customs decorating the trees Christmas. Hear ye the word of the Lord. Speak unto them, Jeremiah. God told Jeremiah, O house of Israel. That's the church. The house of Israel is the church. These are Christians back then. The Israelites are the first true Christians. Thus saith the Lord. Thus saith who? The Lord. Who is the Lord? Jesus is Lord. This showing you back in Old Testament time. Jesus was around. Jesus was speaking. He wasn't manifested in the flesh, but he was still speaking. Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. What is the way of the heathen? Let's see what he says. For the custom of the people are vain. For one cut up a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with an axe. What do the heathen do? They cut the tree down with an axe. They deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with hammers that move not. 
They are upright as a palm tree, but they speak not. They must be born, must be taken care of, because they cannot go. They, are, they have no power. They're being worshipped as a god. They're being worshipped as a god. So every time you put up that tree, every time you put up a symbol of a tree, you are inadvertently worshipping a deity. You know, people say, well, I'm not, you know, you're, you're Satanist. Because all that stuff is birthed by Satan himself. I don't worship Satan. I don't go around and say Satan is Satan that. You don't have to. What you do shows that you're Satanist. Just like people say just going to church is not what make you a Christian. You're right. How you live is what make you a Christian. So how you living? How you living? This is how the Grinch stole Christmas. I'm almost finished. Discerning Christians have long realized that many objects, especially those associated with occultism or idolatry, actually attract demon spirits like magnets attract iron. Be forewarned, Christmas presents may not be the only presents around your tree. Now that's deep. That's deep. Now he touched on, real quickly, the spiritual aspect. Those spiritual warriors out there that know about demonic spirits and gateways and doors and, 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 and what the Bible calls in Acts 20.20, 20, I believe, is uh, the call curious arts, things that you get in parchment. Now, the witches, y'all know what I'm talking about. You root workers, you know what I'm talking about. Parchments and talismans and all of those things. We, you know that they attract demons and deities to give you certain spiritual powers and manifestations to do things. So around your tree ain't no angels. Demons. And that's a whole other Bible study. Let me get out of here. I'm almost finished. I think I'm on my last page. Let me see. No, I got one more page to go after this. And I'm out of here. Well, a page and a half. Two pages and a half. Let's talk about the exchanging of gifts. There is indisputable evidence that the exchanging of gifts at this time of the year was an important part of Roman satirialia Saturnalia celebration. The tradition of giving gifts during the holiday season began even before there was a Christmas. Ancient, Rome's, uh, ancient Romans exchanged gifts during the winter festival of Saturnalia. When this mid-winter festival was adopted into the Roman church, this custom was also adopted. Okay? Now we're going to get to the argument because I already hear you. Obviously, he done heard you. But the wise man bought gifts. Let's rightfully divide what really happened. Come on, I'm almost through. Follow me. The wise men did not exchange gifts among themselves. Plain and simple. They didn't exchange gifts among themselves. They didn't come and give gifts to nobody else. But why did they give them to Jesus? Watch this. It's getting ready to get deep. They presented their gifts to Jesus, who was born the king of the Jews. It was an Eastern custom to present gifts when coming into the presence of a king. But these gifts were not birthday gifts. That was a custom. To honor a king, you would bring a gift. You never present yourself before a king. Even presidents and stuff today, when other presidents and dignitaries come to them, they give them gifts. Believe me, every president is, is rich. If he wasn't rich before he was president, and if he was rich, he's going to get richer. Because dignitaries, it's a custom from over Eastern religion, over Africa, that region. Not here in America, not in the West. But this stuff happening in the East, in the Eastern part of the world. They did not bring gifts for him. But watch this, and, and, and we're going to get deeper. It wasn't a birthday gift. Somebody say, prove it, Apostle. I'm going to have to jump ahead of myself. It wasn't a birthday gift because the wise men didn't even show up until two years after Jesus was born. Two years. He was two years old. Oh, I know that the movies and I know that the comic strips and the books show the wise men there right when he's born. No, he was two years old. Read your Bible. Study your Bible. He was two years old. Because God had him hid. The Father had him hid. Because here I was still looking for him to kill this king that was born. And they had sent spies to follow those wise men. So God allowed them to go the long way to throw them off.
One writer, in reference to this pagan uh, custom, said, the exchanges of gifts and the greetings at near Christmas time began long before Christianity. In the beginning, these presents are said to have simply um, boughs of greenery, boughs from the groves of the um, goddess uh, Saturn Saturnia. Uh, many were charms as well as gifts. They were witchcraft, like I said, the uh, curious arts. Did you know that the early Christians, listen to this, refused to exchange gifts at the time of the year? They knew that the custom did not come from God. It was, it was thoroughly pagan because gift giving was so essential to a part of the pagan celebrations, the early church frowned upon it sternly as upon it and more questionably New Year, the New Year custom as well. That's another Bible study. In the first centuries, the first centuries, Christians did not give each other presents in the Christmas season. Christians in the United States did not practice the heathen custom of exchanging gifts at Christmas until the 19th century when the merchants uh, revived it in order to enrich their own pockets. 19 centuries later, here in America, is when gift giving started on Christmas time. They done played you. They done found a new marketing way to lace their pockets. And you ask any merchant, I used to sell clothes and everything. Any merchant will tell you 50% of their sales for the whole year is that one little time during Christmas. 50% of the yearly income that they make, half of that income comes for the season of Christmas. So that you, it's not going to stop. It's not going to stop. Too many people making too much money off of it. Did you not know the only place in the Bible where exchanging of gifts is mentioned? Look at this. It's in Revelation 11.10. And they dwelt among the earth and shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another. Now, although that sounds like Christmas, it wasn't Christmas. It was the two witnesses that was left behind after the rapture, during the tribulation, that showed signs and wonders of God getting people to get saved that had missed the rapture. They caught them. They killed them. The beast, the Antichrist, killed them, hung them in the streets. Many people say this was Elijah and, and um, some say Moses and some say Enoch. I say it was Enoch and um, Elijah because they're the only ones who didn't see death and everybody is appointed under wants to see death. So they have to come back and die. Um, but people say it was the law and the prophet, Elijah and, and Moses, but I don't agree with that. Moses died. Enoch didn't die and Elijah didn't die. Both of them was translated straight into heaven. And that, they came back in revelations during the tribulations and preached and showed signs and wonders and prophesied. And then the Antichrist and them caught them, killed them, hung them for three days so everybody could see their bodies. This is what's going to happen for those of you who missed the rapture. You're going to be able to see it. And then God brought them back to life. But they was parting over it and giving gifts at the death of the two prophets. That's the only time in the Bible it talks about giving gifts. So he goes further and says, although this sounds like Christmas, the context plainly shows that it will be a wicked celebration of death of God's servants. Then, as in now, it will be an antichrist celebration. It's an antichrist celebration. It's, an anti, it's against Christ. Christ is not his last name, it's his deity, it's who he is. Christmas is against the deity of Christ Jesus. It's antichrist in nature, it's antichrist in manifestation. It's, it's antichrist against Jesus Christ. Let me show you who's really worshipped above Christ. Santa Claus. Some would have you to believe that America's jolly Santa Claus was once St. Nicholas, a kindly old saint who generously gave gifts to the needy. The fact of history, however, proves otherwise. Actually, there is no vivid evidence that any St. Nick ever existed. In spite of Roman Catholic tradition, but the customs and the traditions from which Santa Claus evolved trace him back to Odin and Saturn, the sun god himself. Undeniably, Santa Claus is a god, a little god of some sort, for he has attributes of deity. 
He can visit every house on the earth in one night. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. He knows everything about every kid's behavior. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He rewards the good and punishes the bad just like God, the true and the living God. Make no mistake, this Santa Claus is nothing less than a pagan god once worshipped as Odin or Saturn. This is the last of it, and I'm out. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 32, 16, and 21, 21st verse, they provoke him to jealousy with strange gods. They have moved me to jealousy with that which is not God. They have provoked me to anger with their vanities. All the way back in the Old Testament in Deuteronomy, these people was worshiping false gods. And that worship continues on today. It's a spirit, I'm telling you. The Grinch, this is how he stole Christmas. This is how he stole it. He stole the attention from Jesus the Christ and put it on Santa Claus and trees, gift giving, drinking, suicide, depression. He's collecting his bounty every year. Shockingly, the first Santa can be traced all the way back to the Catherine, Catherine and Jaina deity. A huge bronze, listen to this, a huge bronze idol whose fat swollen belly was an oven and whose arms was extended making a lap or an altar to which presents, which, um, excuse me, to which parents bought their children, laid them on the lap to be roasted alive as an act of devotion to the false god. They sacrificed their own children. In ancient custom, the children themselves were the presents that the parents gave to Santa. That's the original Santa. That's the original Santa. This is how the Grinch stole Christmas. It was birthed out of false worship, idolatry, and through the years, through the decades, through the thousands of years, it's been redressed and redressed and redressed and redressed and redressed. And, redressed. and now, we're going to see it being redressed again because the Antichrist got the rise up, and he's not going to have no competition. He's not going to have no competition. You see it already being watered. I don't know why you upset a Christian because, you know, they, you think that they're attacking Christianity. No, they're not. They're laying hold on their original rights of worship. The nativity scene, it doesn't have nothing to do with Christmas. That is why the law can say, take it down. That's why the law can say, don't say Christmas. Say Xmas or say because it's a winter solstice. Keep just 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 give it a little while longer. The truth is gonna come out. The true worship is coming out. So don't let the Grinch steal your Christmas this year. This is how the Grinch stole Christmas. If you would like this teaching in its entirety, it's 15 pages. I only read you some excerpts. But you need to get this. You need to get this. Send us a donation, at least $5, $10, to cover the packaging, the printing, and we'll send some other things I have with you, too. Uh, 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 I got a CD that I'll send called How to Know the Voice of God. But this is how the Grinch stole Christmas. Don't let him steal your Christmas. If you want to talk about it more, give me a call. But until next time, you be blessed. God bless you.